Hey YouTube, Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. I'm continuing the series we've been putting together since December focused on the Pentagon and defense policy, how it works, what's broken, and what needs to change in order to face future threats. Today's guest in this series is Pete Newell. He was actually mentioned at the top of my episode of Steve Blank back in early December. He is the CEO of a accelerator that's focused on bringing innovations to the battlefield to the boardroom. I know there's so many different things we're going to talk to, acquisition, reform, all that great stuff, and what lessons can be taken from the past 20 years. Hope you all enjoy this conversation, and I will see you all next time. Pete Newell, welcome to The Realignment. Awesome. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, it's great to chat with you. A lot of things I want to hit. Um, your time at the Army's Rapid Equipping Force, broader thoughts on the Pentagon, of course, uh, hacking for defense. We had a great episode of Steve Blank earlier in the month, so this is a good follow-up opportunity. Okay. I want yeah. to just start by just getting an assessment of your worldview looking forward. I think listeners are tuning in. They're going to be thinking about Ukraine. They're going to be thinking about Asia Pacific and Taiwan. You have Air Force generals um, stating that we could be in a war in the next few years, not commenting on whether or not that's appropriate or not. But just how are you thinking about the world geopolitics looking into this period? Wow. Um, <laughs> in 30 seconds or less. So I don't need a perfect. I just want to just start there, you know, because that's the. Yeah, top but of my the thing. world's. I, I, it, it, I don't know. It's easy for me. The world's a complicated place. And, you know, the next conflict is never where we think it is. The Russia Ukraine came out of the blue, although, you know, we watched it happen for a number of years. Uh, Iran Iraq war, uh, Afghanistan. You know, a lot of those things literally popped up where we were not necessarily paying attention. But it seems like increasingly minor state versus state issues are becoming more and more complex. Asia Pacific, you know, I would just call it a powder keg. Uh, I don't, I don't know that you can put a timeline on it because I think there's been a low level conflict in in the South China Sea for years, you know, particularly if you watch, you know, the Chinese behavior in the commercial fishing fields and, you know, their continued encroachment on, on other nation states, economic exclusion zones or the preponderance of illegal fishing. Now, you can look at the Chinese expansion of the Belt and Road concept and their land grab for, um, rare earth metals or or other assets that they require to continue to to grow in China. And then, quite frankly, you can look at it at best you can, you can look inside the Chinese borders and see just um conflict after conflict after conflict. So it it's really hard to put your finger on it and say it's gonna happen here. Is it really China versus Taiwan? Is it China versus China? Is it is it you know more economic? Uh, issues, or is it China versus India? Uh, really, really complex. I, I think you know the, the one way. I don't know. You prepare yourself for that is is to retain the agility to to very rapidly go where the conflict is, and then react to the changes in the conflict as they happen. I really like your point that the next conflict is rarely where you think it's going to be. This, I think, gets us back into um, your history in the Army. If you were looking at the Army in 1999, 2000, 2001, on a political level, on a strategic level, I don't think the... Actually, I'll just ask you, if you if I'd come to you in 2000 and said, hey, the next 13 years there, of your right? career. <laughs> yeah. no, so just, so really just talk, about the, the, talk about how this idea of conflict coming out of nowhere has intersected with your career and the challenges you articulate at the Pentagon. So, so I'm going to tell you my story. Um, 9-11, I was the senior emergency actions officer in the National Military Command Center uh, on the watch team that was on duty on 9-11. Uh, and, and, you know, the NMCC, the, the watch, um, you're essentially, you know, responsible for keeping track of everything that happens in the world. And, you're responsive to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and to the president, and to lots of other people. It, you know, we literally, we were in the middle of a global nuclear control exercise 
which meant that all of the watch centers around the world were fully staffed and up. Uh, all of the National Airborne Command Centers were up and either parked on an airfield someplace or flying, but, but it's rare that all three, you know, three out of the four. Um, yeah, it, and I don't want to say this, but we had literally just killed off the Pentagon as part of the exercise and handed off control to another officer when the senior NORAD officer in, on a watch team was looking at his screen going, holy cow, somebody just flew an airplane into the World Trade Center. And, and as most of us looked up and saw it, we looked up in time to see the second one thinking it was a replay of the first. And he said, uh-uh, this is really bad. Um, I, you know, we went from that crisis to the, uh, I think an airliner uh, exploded flying out of off key airport less than two weeks later to, uh, you know, invading Afghanistan to the Iraq war. I watched all that unfold from a watch team from the perspective of, of nationally seeing it happen. None of that was something that on 910 was even remotely part of uh, what was possible. If you flash forward, you know, I just I flash forward a few years and, you know, I took command of a, an infantry battalion that was actually in the Balkans uh, in Kosovo in uh, 2003. And the day we got on a plane to fly home to Germany to where our base was, they handed us the order of this year to deploy into Iraq in six months. And, and, you know, my experience in Iraq from 2004, 2005, it's just all over the map. None of which was, you know, predicted two years before that. So I guess the big piece that ties your post-military career to this all together is, do you think the Pentagon is equipped for a period in our history where the shifts just seem so rapid? Yes and no. I, I would say as a, as a deliberate planning effort, uh, the assumption is always you have to plan for something or you plan for nothing. So, so oftentimes people get fixated on the plan and not realizing that the, the exercise in building the plan and, and putting the assets in the other is simply practice for something you haven't thought of yet. So, and, and we'll talk about this later is, is the building the capacity to rapidly shift and plan and execute is something you have to practice and you have to continue to work. It's not something you, you invent overnight. So the challenge I think the Pentagon has is that it, you know, over the years and starting with, with McNamara's shift to efficiency is that we have suddenly valued efficiency and the use of assets and resources over effectiveness over their employment. Now, as soon as we get in a conflict, we, we very quickly decide effectiveness is a really big deal. Could you illustrate what efficiency means for a non-military centered person? Yeah, you know, when I say efficiency, I mean, it, it's just like any business out there. It is... Um, using the assets you are given the resources to uh, uh, produce, you know, 120% of the effect with 80% of the resources, which means you're always under resource for everything you need to do. So you become hyper efficient at, at putting those resources out there so that any divergence from, from the rope and from there you know, is, is simply uh, considered wasteful. Effectiveness trades on efficiency and basically says, you know, I'll put the first best, fastest thing I can out there uh, and I will trade speed for, effic for efficiency and performance. But the fastest thing I can get out there is the best thing I can do. And then over time, I'll improve the performance of the thing. And then over time, I will um, improve the efficiency of, of what I was doing. And that, quite frankly, you know, was was the mantra at the Rapid Equipment Force. Speed first, performance and effectiveness came later. Yeah, that's a good opportunity for you to explain um, your your time and your, and your role as the director of the Army's Rapid uh, Equipping Force. Yeah, I guess it's a great opportunity to say, you know, that job was an accident for me. I didn't see it coming. 
I was a brigade commander deployed to southern Iraq, uh, covering an area the size of the state of South Carolina with, you know, several hundred miles of the Iranian border. And, you know, I had a responsibility of, of first reducing the flow of uh, illicit people, weapons, money, influence from, from Iran into Baghdad. And when when folks said, you know, it's time to, to plan your next job. And, and for whatever reason, you know, it wasn't available for all the jobs they offered. And the only thing left was the rapid equipment force. You know, I, I'm certainly not an acquisition officer. I knew nothing about money, um, knew nothing about the politics of money in D.C., not a scientist, not an engineer. I had been an instrument for you know twenty five some odd years. the The beauty of it was, as an instrument, particularly somebody coming off the battlefield, I understood the problems that were on the battlefield. Now, Ref, the Rapid Equipping Force, was beautifully designed by a guy named Bruce Jetty, who eventually became uh, the acquisition senior acquisition official for the Army. Um. It, and it came about at the, the beginning of the Afghanistan war when, you know, at some point, the vice chief of staff of the army, the number two guy in charge, had on his desk uh, front page of a newspaper. Some people remember this, and it had this grizzled instrument standing at the, you know, the entrance of a cave, I think it was up on the Torbora complex. And... And the vice was, you know, kind of thumping his chest. And look how brave this are. You know, we we fielded the greatest army in the world. And then Bruce Jetty, uh, being plain spoken, looked at him and said, "Yep, yeah, that's the bravest army, but the dumbest. And, and of course, the four-star general, you know, immediately started spinning. And and finally asked him what he meant. And, and Bruce looked at him and said, you know, <laughs> we should be calling this cage with robots by now. And they started some back and forth. The vice said, what well, do <laughs> you think, I'm an idiot? I've talked to everybody in the army, everybody I know about robots, and the the vice came back and they, they said they're telling me it's gonna be five years before we can do that. Bruce, being you know, I think he had a PhD in electrical engineering from MIT. He'd been a tank battalion commander, he's really an odd, odd person for the army. Looked at the device and said, That's crap, I can do it in my days. He literally got booted out of the office and told, great, go do it and come back in 90 days. So so here's this colonel <laughs> walking the halls of the Pentagon with no office, no budget, no people. And and with now the mantra to report off back to a really pissed off four-star general about how he's going to put robots in the battlefield. Long story short, he did it uh, and actually did it very effectively. Uh, came back, and you know the reward for what he had done is is the vice chief of staff of the army gave him twelve million dollars, a couple of double wide trailers on Fort Belvoir, which is an army post south of Washington D.C., and and allowed him to borrow people from the Pentagon to to now start solving problems like this more. When I got there, I think I was the fourth director of the Rapid Equipping Force. Um, by that time. It was a hundred and twenty million dollar a year budget. Uh, there were a hundred people and twelve double wide trailers. Still a temporary organization, very lean, very effective in the places that it was. Um, but you know, the rapid equipping force was given the mandate of, of find issues and very quickly solve them with whatever technology you can put your hand on and report back what the problem was, what you did, and, and see if that's scalable. And, you know, for a long time, they did really well. And then at some point, you know, I fault them. I, you know, I came out of Iraq with a laundry list of problems. And the guy that I replaced, you know, opened his book up all these wonderful things they'd done in Iraq. And I looked at it and I said, you did nothing for me. At first, I never heard of you. So that's a problem. Uh, so I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder when I showed up. And what and, were some of those problems? What were some of those problems? So uh, actually, this is helpful. So what were the on paper folder problems that they identified? And what were the actual problems you were encountering in Iraq? So, you know, at the time, the rapid equipping force was based out of Baghdad. So they got a lot of the the bad Baghdad century problems. It's everything from, you know, small combat outposts with only a few people unable to observe what's going on around it. So they built um, 
these you know CCTV cameras and, and kits and things that allow just a couple of people to monitor a wide area of things. The probably one of the most famous ones the when they started using IR triggers or uh, thermal triggers to initiate improvised explosive device attacks on vehicles, they came up with this long extension on the front of a Humvee that hung down that had a heat signature on the front of it. So you, you, you dropped it and you turned it on. And what that did is it pre-detonated an IED so it wouldn't hit the vehicle. It would actually detonate on the trigger. So they did a lot of improvised explosive device work to mm-hmm. counter those things as they rapidly changed because, you know, the the Iranians and, and Al-Qaeda and whoever were very good at, well, we'll change the type of material or we'll change the trigger or we'll change something else. So you're constantly in this battle when we talk about OODA loops is they would watch what we would do to react to something and come up with a new trigger. So while we were scaling the response to one thing, they were scaling a new thing. And, and every time it would just be horrific in the number of, of casualties we took. In my case, in Southern Iraq, you know, I, I had the swamps and I had the rivers and I had, you know, large urban areas and, and lots of open desert. So, you know, in many cases I was worried about things like, you know, entry control points and borders and, patrolling the rivers and patrolling the swamps. And, and I didn't need MRAPs. I needed motorcycles. I needed canoes. I needed um, uh, what I would say is is airfoils, things things that were very different that, that a heavy armor brigade would never touch. But the, it, just given the terrain I was in, if, if I wanted to be as immobile as a smuggler bringing stuff across, I had to have the ability to do that. More so, I had to be able to, to the ability to equip uh, the Iraqi security forces with the same things, and they just weren't available to us at the time. Your your mention of OODA loops uh, means I have to get you to kind of explain like who John Boyd was and and why just like the John Boyd nineteen sixties nineteen seventies conversation is really relevant to the work you're doing today. So take it away. So I, I'll give you the the instrument's description of John Boyd. John Boyd was an Air Force colonel. Um, who, you know, started out in the Korean War and then went to Vietnam. And the shift in Air Force air combat um, losses, we went from, I forget what the number was, like 10 wins versus one loss in Korea to near parity uh, in Vietnam. And, and John Boyd studied the problem, studied the problem, and he came back. And eventually what, what John Boyd is most famous for is the description of the OODA loop. And OODA loop is simply a, an acronym for um, observe, orient, decide, and act. And, and what John Boyd does a very good job of, of describing that very simple term of what it takes to observe what's going on around you and orient on something critical, make a decision what you're going to do about it and act on it and very immediately start that cycle again. In, in combat, the there are two OODA loops going, yours and your protagonist. And the question is, can you get inside there? Which means, can you act so fast that they're constantly observing and orienting on something that, that is useless? When you look at the, the, the improvised explosive device battle of how fast people were changing the way they were building things and how fast they were training the triggers versus how quick or not quick, we were deploying solutions to that and changing our tactics, we were fairly um, behind the OODA loop always. Rarely were we ahead of the the Al-Qaeda or the Taliban or or anybody else in terms of how quickly they were changing things. So so when you talk about OODA loops, it, it's the comparison of yours versus your protagonist. And the goal is to be able to break a protagonist loop which means get inside it in terms of fast that they, they simply can't respond coherently to what you're doing. And a quick uh, follow-up there. I'm wondering, and this relates to your writing about Ukraine, is there an inherent advantage that a insurgent, nimbler, smaller, 
resource constrained force is going to have when it comes to that OODA loop process versus a big one. So obviously this would be, um, you know, the Iranian National Guard, Revolutionary Guard and Al Qaeda in Iraq, and then, you know, the Taliban in Afghanistan. And of course, uh, the, the Ukrainians against like the Russian military. Should we think about it that way? Yeah, you know, the two, I'd say yes. Um, because, you know, a smaller, nimble, more agile um, organization is not encumbered by the bureaucracy and is not enamored with being efficient. They're enamored with being effective. And this is where the Pentagon gets in trouble. It has to shift from being efficient to effective fairly rapidly, and, and it's not good at it. The So I, I would say that there, there are two kinds of... Um, two kinds of groups out there. First is if you have no morals, no laws, no ethics, no whatever, then you don't care how many civilians you kill. You don't care how many of your own people you kill as long as you're winning and doing something. And there's a certain number of organizations out there on the battlefield that are like that. And because they have no, no moral North Star, there's no ethical background to what they do, they will use anything and everything and consider people more like chattel. But then there is the, I would say, the lighter, more agile force that would back up against the wall that will use whatever it can find on the ground to protect itself. I, I think you can look at what, what's happening in Ukraine, but you can also back up and look at um, Aleppo and to what the people who stayed in Aleppo did to protect their neighborhoods. Uh, you can look at uh, Fallujah in Iraq, which is you know, a place that I'm really familiar with. You can look at Grozny. Uh, going back years and years and years into, you know, the Russians uh, first forbay into, uh, you know, modern urban combat and, and how the folks in Grodny actually decimated the Russian forces trying to get into the city. So, so I, I think history is full of places where a lighter, more agile force used the resources that is hand to be very effective against somebody. Now making that permanent as a part of your permanent psyche when you're not in conflict is really hard. And for the most part, the Pentagon has not been good at um, maintaining that capacity. I think a good story of you also wrote about, I'll link this in the show notes, that illustrates the work of the rapid equipping force, but also the bureaucratic difficulties would be um, the... Um, uh, non vehicle, um, so like dismounted IEDs in Afghanistan, I'm um, in 2010, right? So you're starting in January. Um, there's two to three attacks by November 2010. There's over 900. And what's so interesting about this, too, and the way you describe this story, obviously, is that the program, $1.5 billion, were centered around vehicles. So it's, you know, they're yeah. using IEDs yeah. to destroy vehicles. So how do you protect those? It's entirely different from like if you're dismounted infantry walking around um, on a back road. So talk about this issue and how you and the rapid equipping force kind of like struggled and learned from it. So, you know, and I'm back to talk about the MRAPs, the mine uh, resistant ambush protected vehicles. So the MRAP program, you know, was an extensive of the battlefield in Iraq where you know, we were trying to be mobile on the highways and roads in Iraq and, and eventually settled on the South African design for, for vehicles, and they built a program, and they rapidly expanded to build thousands and thousands of things. And it's, it's kind of like World War II S, where it moved pretty fast. It mm -hmm. happened in a matter of years, and they did it. And, and by all history, we'd look at that and say, that's, that's rapid, and we're good at it, and we can do it. And until we went to Afghanistan. And, and in 2010, 2011 is when the President of the United States acknowledged we're losing the battle in Afghanistan. And he sent 20,000 um, infantrymen to reinforce it. And we sent 20,000 light infantrymen. And, and despite the fact the MRI program was hugely successful, uh, those light infantrymen weren't driving around on the highways. They were walking down donkey paths. And the Taliban and Al-Qaeda recognized the opportunity to not have to blow up big vehicles, but they could go after the dismounted instrument. So, so as you know, as you um, acknowledged in the charts, you start seeing, I think the first spike was in the, the spring of 2010 when the Marines entered Helmand Valley, which was largely a light infantry fight. And you saw the first spike to, you know, from one or two of these types of attacks a month, uh, maybe 10. 
By the time I got to Afghanistan, and my first visit as the ref director, we were up around 800. And that very quickly, you know, accelerated the 900 plus attacks a month against um, light infantrymen who, quite frankly, still using the same equipment they've been given in Vietnam. So, you know, over the course of the, the discussion, and, you know, I found a couple of things that really disturbed me. One was that ref had slowly migrated its headquarters to sitting next to the, the bigger division headquarters where they were talking to the generals of people and that's where they were getting that priority and doing things. And no longer were they present at the forward edge of the battlefield where things were changing. So, so they had slowly over time become less an observer of what was going on and predicting what the next issue would be and more just a response mechanism to whatever people told them to do. And which made them essentially part of the bureaucracy. They were responding to other people's priorities. What I found wandering around the battlefield talking to, you know, my peers, people that I had grown up in the military with who were now commanding units was uh, the speed of change of the issues they were dealing with was faster than the speed of the paperwork that was reporting stuff up through multiple headquarters to what the priorities were. So I could, you know, literally have a top of three brigade commanders, colonels and commander large formations. And one one would say, listen, I'm losing people at a rate of 10 and, and 15 a day. I don't have time to explain what my problems are. I need somebody to look over my shoulder and just hand me stuff to fix them. I'm, I'm too busy trying to keep my people alive. I can't, I can't figure out what to tell you to build for me. The next guy, a little further outside of the city, says, you know, listen, the real issue is these IEDs against our, our dismounted forces, which is the first time I've heard anybody articulate the problem. The third guy was the guy who commanded the Joint Special Operations Task Force. He said, I need you to take all that stuff you did for big vehicles driving down the highways, you know, ground penetrating radar and, and stuff. And I need you to shrink it down to something that fits on the back of a helicopter. And, and that really was the first one. He said, this is, here's the problem. I need to be able to get the last hundred meters to an objective without losing my special operators who are irreplaceable. And it needs to be done by a robot, but it needs to be, you know, equipped with the right things to actually clear that path to the front door of a building. None of that appeared in a priority list anywhere in, in any of the headquarters that I talked to. And when I challenged people on it, they said, you know, <laughs> who do you think you are? I have this list from the four star. I have this list from the three star. I have this list from the two star. But those lists were being staffed for months and months and months and months. And people were moving programmatic money versus saying, you know what? Let's just go find something to answer these problems. And so first I faulted ref for not being present at the forward edge of the battlefield where they would see that problem arising and describe it so people could react to it faster. Uh, and second, I, you know, I faulted the process for, for being too slow. Yeah, when you look at it, it took us nine months to a year to recognize that new problem, the shift from attacks on vehicles, the shift on air men. It took us nine months to provide a solution to the battle. And, in, in, and then probably another nine months after that to actually get it scaled. Well, that's 18 months. When you looked at what the Taliban were doing, they were on a four-month cycle. So, so there'd be a spike, we'd responded to it, and, and then they would back off. As they observed what we were scaling, they would change the trigger, change the mechanism, change something else, and then they would double it. So their OODA loop was turning in about a four-month cycle, and we were turning in a 15-month cycle. The gap between the two cost us almost 5,000 casualties. Now, you look at Ukraine, say that's almost the exact same thing that's going on between the Ukrainians and the Russians. Russians are too slow. They're not reacting fast enough, and the Ukrainians are spending on a dime. I think the question then would as you're describing the approach that the insurgents are taking during the um, wars of the 2000s and the 2010s how does this dynamic and problem we were identifying aka just too too long 
of, of a process and feedback and everything. How does that apply to a more of a great power centric uh, competition c- scenario? So, so you look at, you know, I started this narrative a long time ago. And actually, I was still a rep. And, and it basically said the way um, technology is proliferating now, it means that just about anybody with cash and intent can build a um, a lethal response to something that can hurt just about anybody badly wherever and whenever they want. They may not be able to sustain it, but they can have an impact that you know that that teutonically changes the way people look at the world. Look at the the Boston Marathon bomber. The two guys who knew nothing about anything managed to build a pressure bomb, and look what it cost the city of Boston. And the impact nationally on on our moral and and how we felt about the world. And it's just two guys. The way technology works today is that um, trying to keep up with not just the adoption of technology and the adaption of that adoption is moving at a speed that's almost impossible to keep up with. So if if you've not built the mechanisms that you need to observe where technology is going and understand it, which means you have to actually dabble in it, and then understand that, that once it hits the battlefield, and the battlefield, it could be an economic battlefield, it could be a military battlefield, um, it's going to change, and it's going to change rapidly. If you don't have the systems and the people built to recognize that change and either take advantage of it or build a counter to it, you are eventually going to get um, fall far behind somebody else in that OODA loop. And, and I think that's, you know, you're seeing it happen in Ukraine versus the Russians, but, you know, for, for many cases, you know, the Chinese used that against us for a long time. And, and in many cases, we've fallen behind the Chinese in a lot of things that we should not have. As I discussed at the start of the episode, you you know you began your military career in the 1980s. You were an infantryman. You're covering this you know 32 year period that takes you from the Cold War to the um, quote unquote peace from 1990s, then to the war on terror. If you were starting your career today, would you still choose the same branch? Would you still choose the same MOS? Because obviously a a Cold War that's centered around what happens in Germany, that's obviously going to be one where the army, infantry, armor, et cetera, et cetera, are going to be particularly prominent. If we're talking about an Asian powder keg, you know, there's a reason why the Marine Corps has dumped their tanks. Um, that's a branch that's re-envisioning itself. So I'm just curious what, you know, 18 to 24-year-old Pete would do in today's context. That's absolutely unpredictable. I I answered the question. I, I think the the answer is yes, I would probably do the same thing, but I think that battlefield has changed so much. And the best way to describe it is, you know, many of my peers, our children have followed us into the military. My mm-hmm. oldest son did. My oldest son, you know, graduated from Virginia Tech in 2013, became an instrument, did his first tour in Korea, went to a striker unit in um, Colorado, and they changed branches to be a military intelligence officer. And and he did a tour in Iraq and Syria, came back and was a company commander at Fort Hood. Um, but he saw these changes so fast. So his his tour, I think it was 2015. I, I they don't know when his tour in Iraq ended, but it was at least 10 to 15, 10 years after mine. It was so dynamically different. And and when he got out, he went to work for an AI company. <clears throat> now he's building solutions that the Navy is putting to use with the Unmanned Task Force for you know some wildly different things. And so I watch his pattern of development over time versus mine. And and I would say that there there needs to be as we're recruiting what I would say a class of entrepreneurs. People with entrepreneurial backgrounds and spirit in virtually every MOS or classification of military. So I think it's less about the branch than about the collection of people who understand the concept of mission acceleration. How do I quickly identify problems that are emerging 
using a lot of tools to quickly understand those those problems and the potential off the shelf solutions, whether they come from the military, or they come from the commercial world, and how they can be banded together and applied to help us better understand the problem. And then how do we very rapidly build um, operating concepts around that technology and the problem and very quickly solve it or continue to solve it over time. I, I think that's, it's a skill set that is not incubated and kept inside the military. And, and you know, the best example I can look at is I, I'm a class act. I never belonged in the ref. I never would have imagined. I would never have signed up to be the director of rapid equipment force. But I was that, you, is that, is that a combination of, your personal interest and like possible career advancement. Like how I do you a battlefield yeah. commander? Yeah. I, you know, I'm the warrior. I'm a warrior. I command large groups of people and went over and fight the battles. Yeah. And, and you, you know, my trajectory as a paratrooper to, you know, a young captain of the Ranger regiment, to my time as a battlefield commander as, as a battalion commander and as a brigade commander, I was destined to be a general doing the same thing. And then somebody slapped me into the rapid equipment for us. Then I realized that I was gifted at, at doing what I was doing there. And there was no job description for it. So at some point when the army said, Hey, you know, you did a great job there. We're going to send you someplace else. I said, no. <laughs> and when they said, no, we really mean it. I said, yes, or I, and I eventually we realized that I was addicted to what I was doing at rough. And, and that's what brought about my retirement because I realized the army would never let me continue to do that job, but that's the job that I wanted for my life. Um, most of the people like me, whether it's the defense innovation unit, um, AFWorks, Naval X, uh, army applications lab, even the people at ref, all of them are gone. Do you realize that, that there's no former director of the defense and unit innovation unit still in service. Same for AFWorks, same for Naval X, same for the ref. We all left service at the end of the jobs because there was no place left for us to go. So, so I come back to your original question, would I do the same thing? The answer is yes, but mm -hmm. I think the, you know, my experience in the, in the Ranger regiment, um, both at the time and, and with them later on, was probably the epitome of the, of the future because you're constantly driving for a new solution to things. You didn't let the the system get in the way of what you were learning and the very rapid application of new ideas to, to get around a problem. It, and I think that that's more the class of people we need in the military in the future than, than we've actually had in the past. The challenge with the military is that they're going to have to learn um, first, how to provide those experiences so you can identify the innovators and the entrepreneurs. And, and second, they're going to have to create a doctrine around that. There's no doctrine for, for being an entrepreneur in the military. The idea of mission acceleration that I described at REF is not imbued in any doctrine anywhere. Therefore, it's not funded. It's not resource. There's no can you explain the role? question for it. Can you explain the role of doctrine in the military? Like why, why is you know, doctrine important? Yeah. So doctrine drives, um, I'll start with culture. Anywhere in the world, culture is based on a common language and common beliefs. And, and language and those beliefs actually generate organization to society and how people react to one another, drives trade and everything else. In the military, you trade out culture for doctrine. Doctrine is the same thing. It sets up how we fight, how we're organized. Um, how we're organized drives, how we're manned and equipped and, and how people are promoted and, and what we do. So we have doctrine for military intelligence, for fires, for mission command, for all those things the military has to do. We have no doctrine for acceleration, for accelerating our understanding of problems. We have no doctrine for the acceleration of um, concept development and application on the battlefield. Those are things we just do as a response to a problem, not with a deliberate effort saying, we know that this is a way we're going to have to fight forever. So there's no doctrine that connects um, the output of what innovation does to warfighting. Now, Steve Blank and I and, and Steve Spear, you know, talking back and forth, have described that as mission acceleration. 
So if you looked at all the warfighting functions out there, there is not a warfighting function called mission acceleration. If it were in doctrine, then you'd be able to look at it and say, these are the resources we're, we're applying to build a class of people who can do this. Here's the language they're going to use to describe what all of these innovation hubs out there are doing and why they have budgets and what they're supposed to do and what they bring to the force. Without that doctrine, we're going to extend to spend um, a couple of billion dollars a year spread across the hundred different innovation platforms and get maybe 10% of the output that we should be getting. And we're going to continue to lose the people because they're not going to stay in, in service. You know, something I'm curious about, especially given the fact that there's a more than decent percentage of this audience that is coming from uh, the Silicon Valley tech space. What have you learned from just like your stint in Palo Alto? You're going from what is arguably the most hierarchical organization slash institution in American life to, and obviously there are hierarchical startups, but once again, the culture, the mythos, the narrative that's driving one's head is not hierarchical in that same sense. So is there a way to, I guess this is kind of a way of, you could be a cliche and say there's the West Coast instinct in America, there's the East Coast instinct. Is there a way to merge these two instincts? in a way that's productive and helpful so that folks from DOD could go into the technical space and take their lessons, like to your point, mm -hmm. and then people who are in the startup world who, you know, never would have been successful um, as enlisted, um, you know, enlisted um, um, soldiers, airmen, sailors, Marines, and definitely never would have commissioned like out of college. And maybe they're in their 30s and 40s. Like, how can this maybe be merged together? That's something I'm always driven by. So I, I think that was one of my epiphanies as a ref director. Yeah. And what I say was the most uh, professional and rewarding assignment I ever had is it's the first time I had a job in the military where there was nobody between me and anybody. I essentially worked for the vice chief of staff of the Army who, who didn't give me a whole lot of tasks. He basically said, you know, your job is not to come in here and blow sunshine at me and tell me how good you're doing. Your job is to come in here and tell me what's broke in the Army so I can fix it. And, and I will never forget, I was sitting down with, you know, two three-star army generals having a discussion about something, and one of them was yelling at me. And, and it went on for quite some time before he kind of calmed down. And he said, you know, ultimately, you make me nervous. And he said, but then again, that's your job. My job was to make people nervous. My job was to find things that were broken and point them out to people. Um, it is the first time I think in my career, other than being a combat, that I was allowed to use everything I had ever learned, every network I had ever built, and, and everything I could pull together to actually affect the change. And nobody got in my way. I didn't have to say, may I? I didn't have to say, please. I didn't have to ask for anything. That, that's the epitome of being an entrepreneur. Is, is simply to take everything you have at, at your, in your persona, in your being, and put it against doing something and make that happen. Um, it, it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in fact, it's not healthy. <laughs> um, it's not. You have to be half crazy to do it. So I, I, I think I want to go back to this idea of adopting a culture of the type of thing we need to build is we need to build these, um, what we have coined innovation navigators, the people who have this optional mindset that are embedded in government organizations so that there is at least a receptor that talks to and understands the rest of the world. Yeah, you know, so I'll you know, go back to what I learned from Silicon Valley. You know, my first lesson, uh, you know, I was a ref director and I was sitting at Google talking to a bunch of engineers about an energy problem. And, and we had a great conversation and it was like, we did one-to-one -one agreed on what the potential solution was. And it turned out that Google's work in that direction. So I asked the guy, how much can I pay you to, to actually help me solve my problem? And he laughed at me. And, and on a dry erase board, he draws this big circle. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of that circle, he puts a little pinprick and he says, that big circle, that's me and my budget, that prick in the middle, that's you. He said, I don't need your money. And he said, what I needed from you was a better example or a better explanation of the problem I was trying to solve. What I, and they said, thank you. <laughs> it, it left. <laughs> it was like, I never painful. Um, 
what I realized is that my money in the valley didn't matter. What mattered was I had the best, sexiest explanation of a problem that people needed. And when I could describe one of my problems in a manner that made sense to somebody in a commercial world, I had a lot of power and I had a lot of influence. The the challenge between you know the Pentagon and the and, and Silicon Valley is not one of one doesn't like the other is they have two different business models, mm-hmm. and and the Pentagon has a hard time understanding Silicon Valley's business model and adapting to it. They just assume Silicon Valley in the commercial world is going to adapt to theirs, and the answer is not anymore. Is with a lot of this technology, the government is not the first best most dominant user, uh, and nor will they ever be. And, and they're now having to learn how to buy things and use things that are uh, predominantly being built on a commercial world. They're trying to do that with people who are trained, equipped, and organized to do something completely different. Like back to the doctrine thing over and over and over again. They're not building a cadre of entrepreneurs nor are they building programs for rapidly developing uh, operating concepts and doing dot with the up, which is uh, the the doctrine, maintenance, organization, training, and all that stuff you have to do when you field something. You know, that typically takes years to figure out. We need to be able to do that in six months. And we need to do that for things we're only going to field for three to five years before they change so much that we have something to do. The the Pentagon largely still thinks that's an aberration to reality. And they're unwilling to realize that, that you know, 10% of the budget probably ought to go doing that stuff instead of the 0.0001% that, that's going at it today. I guess what I'm kind of wondering, when you refer to the, and I think this is something that's helpful for civilians such as myself who are, conducting the conversation but also listening is you just referred to the pentagon as if the pentagon is this singular the singular thing but the pentagon obviously is an organization and organizations are composed of people so at this point in the game the pentagon is led by folks who came up during the wars in iraq and afghanistan so these are folks who i think from my perspective would have seen how a the process you just described is so essential they would have seen and viscerally experienced the need for this entrepreneurial aggressive approach. So why does that happen organizationally, right? Like why, why are we telling, there's a version of this podcast if that were the format that we could have done in 1999 and you may have offered the same critique. Why would mm-hmm. the experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan have not been enough to change that broad critique? Because you know, at the end of the day, the the processes and the design of the planning, program, budgeting, and execution, the PPBE process that's been in place for 60 years, which drives, quite frankly, the defense um, industrial market is, is largely designed on building big, long programs that deliver complex things that take years to build, but over time, return shareholder dollars to people with, with it. It's just, it's an enormous undertaking to change the, the line on things. I think despite the fact that, you know, a lot of us had very different experiences in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, military assignments with the Pentagon are also short. I'm only there for a couple of years before people rotate out. And I think that's one of the frustrations that people in Silicon Valley have. Yes, you know, when, when an investor stands up a fund, they're with that fund for at least 10 years, mm-hmm. if not longer. And, and, and I laugh when, when people in the military say, well, we're, we're defense ventures or we're army ventures or we're something else. I say, listen, you're going to be in your job for two years and you're going to go do something else. You will never be held accountable for the results of what you were doing. Somebody else is going to be. Yeah, which means... There's little consistency of change other than what was blueprinted before because everybody comes in and says, I'm going to change something. By the time they figure out what they're supposed to change and actually start to make the change, they're headed for a new job. And then the next person comes in and starts all over again. So so from a, 
uh, a change standpoint, there's no consistency to it over time. So it takes forever to actually to see that, that change happen. That said, the civilian force that, that also manages the, the system has been there for years. And, and in many cases, the, the chewing of compliance and, and everything else has taken over and said, you know, when was the last time you heard somebody in the Pentagon or, or on the government say, listen, I just want you to be barely compliant? <laughs> Versus this idea of perfect compliance to everything. We're going to follow the rules with T and we're going to reward people for following the rules to T and never changing anything. And if you fail at something, then, then that's bad and we're going to throw you out. Silicon Valley says we're going to celebrate the rule breakers and the, and the guy and the folks who fail because they're the ones that are learning the faster, fastest and, and they're actually doing something. So it, you have this culture change between the two. It's a paradigm that's really hard to break. I think that's that's why oftentimes we're, you know, we had the same problem when we thought jointness back, you know, after Grenada. And we went through the, the Packard Commission and lots of congressional studies that eventually went to the Goldwater Nichols Act that forced the military to become more joint. You know, we're probably at the same point where the Pentagon is not going to change itself. It's going to take congressional action to force something different to happen. You know, what, what if we had a third undersecretary? You know, we have ANS and we have RNA. We have the sustainment folks and we have the, uh, rap, the rapid engineering, but, uh, research and engineering folks. What if you had a third undersecretary whose job it was to collect all these innovation things and their job was to essentially do what REF did, but do it at scale? Wouldn't that be amazing? Because suddenly we'd have a doctrine. Uh, we'd have different rules for different people. We'd have the ability to rapidly um, harness uh, the innovation ecosystem in a commercial world to deliver capabilities at speed and scale uh, for the next conflict, regardless of where the conflict is. I'm curious, as you know, we're nearing the end here. Do you have a do you have a theory of change when it comes to something like that? So, for example, it's easy to say, oh, well, Congress is Congress and Congress is never going to do that. But once again, Goldwater, Nichols is a, you know, like that's a, that's Congress doing something. There was obviously a set of problems and circumstances that created a vacuum. Those photo for response that that's doing my perspective. Things are addressed when there's a vacuum to be filled and there's incentive to fill that vacuum. Um, the question for me is, does that vacuum get filled after a conflict? Right. So are you prepping for MRAPs in 03, or are you doing it in 06 after thousands of people have been um, maimed and killed? Um, so it's not a question of, of of if, it's a question of when. What would your theory of change be if you're articulating these potential reforms? I think shifting the narrative to, you know, on a, the pick on the Chinese, the the inflection point, when the Chinese capabilities outpace the, outpace the U.S., it will be very difficult for us to catch up. So, so while they've not surpassed us yet, if they are increasing the speed and efficiency at which they're able to develop new things and, and put them on the battlefield, wherever the battlefield is, when that actually crosses um, our capabilities, it would be really hard for us to go from an incremental 1% or 2% change a year to 15% to catch up. So if we don't start, the chances of us um, being surpassed by a pure competitor are much greater. How do you uh, assess? How, how I'm curious how the the war in Ukraine shifts your perspective on um, competition and just the general question of like who's surpassing who. I mean, T four. You know, think of if, if it's 2017, I'd be saying, look at the T fourteen uh, Russian tank. It's incredible. It's so advanced. We're using M1 Abrams from the Cold War. And then the, the T-14 isn't even used in the war in Ukraine because it's probably, and this is me overstating my expertise here, but you know, it's there, there's a likely case to be made that it's kind of like a white elephant um, that isn't actually right. usable on the battlefield. You could say the same thing for like the Su-57 jet. So when it comes to you assessing Chinese capabilities, how do we separate the narrative of, wow, it's a carrier killer missile from the question of, okay, but if there actually were a conflict, is this actually a threat that would determine our actions? 
Yeah, I, I think the I come back to pinpointing the actual threat versus the ability to identify a threat and rapidly reaction to it is the difference. Okay. So, okay, hypersonics and AI are a threat. Understanding how that threat will actually manifest itself is like looking at a crystal ball. The question is whether you recognize it when it starts and, and can you very rapidly reorient to it? You know, I'm giving you an example, you know, um, switchblade is uh, an unmanned aerial system that, that actually blows up when it hits things. We actually put that on the battlefield in Afghanistan, I think in 2012. Switchblade was a precursor to the drone war you're seeing now, where it wasn't just drones that are flying around looking at things, is drones are being flown quite effectively um, in a battle. So, you know, if you look at Ukraine sometimes, they say, really, the battle of drones. Mm-hmm. Um, tanks on the battlefield. It'll be interesting to see what happens when the Leopard 2s and, and M1s make it into the Ukraine versus uh, a different... Um, a much different environment. And I I say that as somebody who's, who's probably one of the few battlefield commanders who's actually fought uh, a mounted urban battle in, in modern history, like the two of us uh, in Fallujah in 2004, where I commanded a heavy task force with tanks and batteries inside the city. Um, this is very different. And I will say it was difficult then. Mm-hmm. It's going to get much harder now. That's coupled with this this concept of open source intelligence. It's hard to hide from anything. The good news is you can see everything, but but now it's hard to hide from anything. So it really does become the speed of the UDA loop. Can I move faster than a decision? So I, I and that's not just a. I don't say that to avoid your question. I think the again it is going to come down to the speed of our ability to recognize something has changed dramatically in a conflict, whether it's on the battlefield or whether it's economics or something else, the speed of our ability to articulate that in a manner that people can understand, the speed of our ability to rapidly assemble groups of people, think the Manhattan Project, how fast that came together, and then how fast we can actually produce uh, a first best, most adequate solution and put it back out into the conflict to determine whether or not we even understood the problem to begin with and to determine the, I call it the half-life of the problem. How fast will the tech and the concept change to the point where what we were producing is now obsolete and we need to move on to something else? That's and, that's the missing link, is to do that intentfully. And to tie everything together, that's the key to the um, dismounted IED story in Afghanistan, because the key there is you're identifying that we thought the problem were vehicle-centric IEDs. Actually, the actual problem is that they're affecting dismounted infantry. So the speed at which we can identify, address, and then deal with that problem is a, is a good way to think about this. So just to, just to close, Pete, this has been, this has been very helpful, especially looking um, from the outside, uh, more from, from the tech side of things is just to close, like, what would you suggest interested um, younger folks should look into? So like 30 somethings, probably specifically in either like Pentagon, military tech, or interested in this topic area. So, so I think in terms of reading, uh, I will tell you that not to, not to stand on a bullet book, but the material that Steve Blank, Steve Spear, who's a, you know, a professor out of MIT, and I are writing, we're writing politically on you know, the subject as we're trying to think through it. But, you know, obviously, I would dig a little bit further past that and, and and watch like you have to get past the rhetoric and actually watch the lessons that are learned being learned in the ukraine russia war without picking sides but try and put yourself in the place of both and understand what decisions you might make or or how you might look at the the same place i, I think the getting involved if you really want to get experience and, and you know we didn't talk about hacking for defense but you know, the Common Mission Project, which is the nonprofit we spun out years ago, um, has built this beautiful program of a, you know, graduate and undergraduate level course at universities that allow 
students to take on real emerging uh, problems, whether it's in military diplomacy, climate, or something like that, and build teams as if they're entrepreneurs trying to solve a problem and do something. The students are one thing, but actually mentoring and advising those students through the process of learning what it's like to be an entrepreneur and actually try and discover this process is has been amazing for everybody who's ever touched it. So, you know, it's one of those things that that if if you know your alma mater offers the course or you're close to the university does that, I think get involved, get back into the classroom where the students are and they're doing this really great work, and and gain some experience from it. Well said. Pete, thank you for joining me on The Realignment. And folks who've enjoyed this conversation, I suggest you check back and listen to the episode of Steve Blank if you have not done so already. Awesome. Thank you.